So we're welcoming Alexei Radinsky, who joins us from Kiev. We are super excited to have him here. Um, and even more exciting is he will be screening a new work, a film work called People Who Came to Power, which has been made in collaboration with Thomas Raffa this year. Um, Alexei will introduce this, and then we'll screen the film, which is around 17 minutes. And then we're going to welcome Owen Hathley and Daniel Trilling to the stage, who will be in conversation with Alexei. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, and thanks for this invitation. Uh, this is actually going to be quite an abrupt change of subject. I have to say that after the previous presentation, I feel a little bit like a single white Ukrainian here. And um, sure. yeah, so um, I, I wanted to start with relating in a way to the topic of uh, this uh, symposium, the fear of missing out, because it really seems to me that uh, actually one of the triggers of this current crisis and war in my country was in a way this collective fear of missing out, this kind of neurotic anxiety of being left out of the, of the possibly better world. And for many, of course, this better world uh, was associated somehow with the future utopia of Europe, in a way, but, uh, and which of course was the driving force of the uprising at Maidan Square in Kiev. But in case of others, their fear of missing out was actually caused by a utopia that is deeply rooted somewhere in the past. So they basically fear that they would miss their last chance to escape the anxieties of today and of by uh, into a remake of a Soviet past, a kind of historical reconstruction which was promised to them by the Russian government. And so uh, the film that you will see now kind of shows uh, the mechanisms of this anxiety and also its outcomes. So basically, the, uh, this film is titled People Who Came to Power, and it is my current collaboration with Tomasz Rafa, a Slovakian filmmaker. And it's a second film in a series of documentaries uh, that uh, deal with an ongoing turmoil in uh, Ukraine. And uh, basically, my, primary, my basic interest as a filmmaker is uh, the ways in which the social movements are represented and misrepresented. And uh, that's why in the last year and a half or so, uh, my country didn't leave me much uh, choice of what to engage with. My previous film was a kind of an anthropological uh, study of the violence and uh, the way the violence uh, transforms the social movements. And it was based on the example of uh, the Maidan Square uprising in Kiev. And the film you will see today is a kind of a second installment in this series or a postscript to it. And it applies basically the same approach uh, to the movement of anti-Maidan in the East Ukraine, uh, which is actually a movement uh, that had ultimately provoked uh, the bloody war and the uh, Russian intervention in the East Ukraine. Uh, so uh, the subject of this film is, to put it very bluntly, a counter-revolution. And I would like to, cl to clarify a little bit what does the counter-revolution means for us today. And its narrative is very uh, simple. And it goes like uh, this. So if there is a popular movement that leads to an uprising and an overthrow of power, then the only possible outcome of this would be the war, uh, be it a civil war or a hybrid war. And uh, this narrative actually tells us to obey and withdraw from any kind of dissent. Because otherwise, our hated status quo will seem to us like a paradise, actually, compared to what will come next after, after after this dissent and uprising and the revolution. So uh, basically, and one of the major concerns of this film is also the fragility of the border between war and peace. Because it turns out that uh, peace and war are actually not kind of separate entities that form an opposition, but rather uh, their peace is always in inscribed in the order of war and vice versa. <clears throat> um, so this film, uh, that you're going to see was shot in the course of one month in spring uh, last year in the Donbass region in East Ukraine, and it was actually not meant to be a film at all. Originally, this footage was shot for a series of online video reportages that Tom McGrath and me were producing basically for the sake of counter information. Uh, we went to Donbass without actually any clear plan of what to do there, uh, what to film there, and no one could know how the situation would develop. At that point, when the Crimean Peninsula was already annexed and occupied, and actually the Russian forces were about to enter uh, East Ukraine, 
so we were lucky to kind of infiltrate uh, the ranks of the anti-Maidan movement. Uh, we started to produce these short online reportages in the mode of direct cinema, so which were opposed to this kind of modes of propaganda which uh, took over the media production on both sides of the conflict at that time. So uh, these reports were initially shot and edited in a very fast manner and then immediately disseminated online uh, through various media channels. And uh, basically a year later we decided to revisit this footage in a more attentive and maybe analytical, more analytical way, uh, given the experience of a year of war in Ukraine. And this is basically how uh, this film came about. Um, I would really like to advise those who sit in the back to come closer because uh, the film is, you will have to read the subtitles a lot. So, yeah, let's maybe start. Okay, so thank you, Alexei, for coming here and introducing your film. Um, that's the first time I've seen it, so it's given me a, lo a lot to think over now. Um, just before we start, I should probably briefly introduce Owen and myself. So, this is Owen Hatherley, who is a author and critic who writes about architecture, aesthetics, music, um, and has a specific interest in post-Soviet countries. Is that a, a good way of putting it? Uh, and I'm, uh, my name's Daniel Trilling. I'm the editor of New Humanist magazine, and um, I'm also a, a reporter who's working on a, a long research project about refugees at, at the borders of Europe, which has taken me on occasion to Ukraine, and that's how I I know Alexei. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the, the line that struck me most from that film was, was right near the beginning where one of the interviewees said um, that the vertical of power has collapsed and that, you know, they were trying to do something to restore power. And um, that just made me think about, you know, what a brief window of opportunity it was that, that you had as a filmmaker to go in there and film in that, um, you know, when, when there's a revolutionary situation and existing power structures come under stress or start to collapse, it, it also sort of um, forces open a, an opportunity for the production of images to be taken over and, and, and controlled by people who do not normally have access to them. Um, and I thought... You know, that was interesting on two levels because one, you were able to get in there and do this very um, immediate reportage um, style filming that would, as, as you said, would not have been possible a few months later when, when the production of images had become much more tightly controlled by um, the two rival, rival sides in this war. Um, I just wonder if you had some reflections on, on, on you know, what what potential that, that has. Yeah, uh, thanks for this point about the vertical of power. I would like to first comment on this because I'm not sure uh, how legible it is here, but the vertical of power is a very direct reference on the side of this guy uh, to Putin's rhetoric, actually. So the vertical of power is actually the term that was introduced by Vladimir Putin in the first years of power when he was claiming that he is restoring the real power, taking it away apparently from the oligarchs. Uh, into his own hands, so basically the structure of the Russian authoritarianism, which these people actually very much admire and uh, kind of uh, see as an example of their kind of um, as a model, is basically a quote from uh, Vladimir Putin, so uh, which um, I find uh, I find uh, quite important because actually the first the the whole of the first episode. Um, um, is, I think, uh, intentionally quite dubious because what we seem to be watching is a kind of an apparently anti-war protest. So these are people who are presenting themselves as ultimately pacifists and people who are actually trying rhetorically to pre at least to prevent the war or something like this, but what they're doing in their political practice is kind of aiding the side of the military aggressor who has just declared the intention to invade the, their territories by painting themselves as pacifists, basically. So um, this, was, uh, um, this was important. And of course, um, what you said about uh, uh, the image production um, there is, um, um, is true uh, because 
one of the reasons why we could film there at all was that at that point they really wanted them to be filmed, which was not absolutely not the case um, later on. And one, one last uh, thing I have to add, uh, just for the sake of justice, so uh, this film was based, this film is based on the footage taken during two trips, uh, two, two different expeditions, and uh, in the first one, we were there together. In the second one, I was already not there. I could not. I could not go there as a, as a, a owner of Ukrainian passport uh, issued in Kiev, which would be a huge problem if anyone would check my documents in the city of Slavyansk, which was already occupied by these forces. Uh, Tomek, luckily, as an owner of a Slovakian passport, could travel there and we could continue this work. I. I wonder if I want to talk about this a little bit in the context of the earlier film, which people here won't, won't have seen, but which is online and online with English subtitles, which is Why Violence, which was made during the protests in Kiev. Um, and the film seemed to share this quality of kind of asking people, why do you do what you do politically? They're very textual, very much about people explaining their motivations. And I, I wonder if you have anything to, to say about that, to say about that, 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 that there's a kind of on some level, a sort of respect for people saying why they are doing this thing. And absent of this are many of the causes behind this. Like, in your introduction, you kind of um, talked about this being, you know, the, the, the sort of direct cinema being different to the propaganda on, bo on both sides, as you describe it. Um, but, of course, this is what's sort of lurking in the background, I think, of both of those films unmentioned. Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Um, thanks for bringing this uh, work in, because uh, this little bit explains uh, basically uh, how um, I tend to work with these representations of uh, various movements. So uh, this is largely based on, on the interviews, and after that uh, uh, what we try to do is to make a very condensed, a very condensed image of of the movement, so uh, basically um, the previous film is as long as this one, it's 17 minutes, but it spans uh, the time from December 2013 to March 2014, so it's a very uh, kind of dense uh, image uh, based on uh, the self-representation of, of the participants. And of course in this situation you have to be really kind of uh, careful about editing and uh, about the selection process, which is of course subjective, but in a way represents the vision of, uh, of this movement. In this case, uh, although uh, this, this situation and this uprising or this movement was uncomparably smaller in scale, uh, one important thing to understand about uh, the revolution and uh, this, is that this was this never came to be a mass movement? It was quite small. I, have, I can, I think, I have the right to say that as a witness of it, which is actually also the reason why uh, they had to send the troops finally. I mean, the Russian army had to kind of come and facilitate the social the social movement, which was in obvious decline and which didn't have mass support. Um, yeah, uh, which is an important difference, I think, from uh, Maidan, for instance. Okay, um, I mean, I had a question, there's maybe more, more for you. Um, there was another line near the beginning that, that struck me, which was one of the slogans on the posters that said, Donbass is mighty. And it just reminded me of what Alexei was saying in his introduction about, um, you know, the, the, the fear of missing out that was motivating the anti-Maidan protesters was that they were going to lose their chance to, to sort of um, restore the life that they believed they'd once had on, on, you know, during the Soviet Union. And um, I think it's interesting context to know a bit more about the Donbass as a region itself because it's a, it's a region of Ukraine that, that played quite a crucial role in, in the Soviet imagination and um, in, in Soviet film, for example. I wondered if there was anything you wanted yeah. to say. I mean, funnily enough, the last time I did a thing at the ICA was about four years ago when I introduced Vertov's Symphony of the Donbass, um, which is a, a propaganda film made in 1930, a very early sound film, about the, uh, the kind of mechanization of the mining industry there. 
And you've written about this, actually, so you might want to come in on this. So it's basically, off the top of my head, the obvious in comparison in Britain is South Wales. You know, mines, steel works, lots of small towns, couple, one couple of big towns being Donetsk and, and Lugansk, but also, um, you know, and, uh, Stakhanov, you know, the kind of famous um, worker who, you know, mined more coal than any other, you know, was a miner in Donbass. So there's this kind of, you know, very much part of that kind of workerist imaginary. Although it's very striking watching the film, how you see, you know, you see a hammer and sickle flag, but you also see orthodox icons, you see the Tsarist eagle, you know, it, it's, it's very, very hard to see this as an, an, as a sort of unambiguously left-wing movement. It's a sort of weird sort of conjunction of, on the one hand, you know, these fascists and imperialists from Kiev are going to come and, and take us over, and at the same time, this imagery which is usually associated with the right wing. But, um, yeah, you should probably talk about Vertov rather than me, really. Mm. Yeah, I uh, would like to add uh, one thing about Donbass, actually. Uh, maybe not at the time about Vertov. Uh, there is another poster uh, here. I don't know if it's uh, also legible, but it literally says, European Union, why don't you hear us? And so basically, I I was really striking by this uh, by this poster because it actually um, it actually reveals uh, this kind of actually scandalous relationship uh, that the EU kind of was uh, that EU had uh, towards the Ukraine. So just to clarify a little bit, uh, uh, some part of 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 the of of the agenda of these people in Donbass and their total unwillingness to to join the. Maidan movement or to join the EU was the obvious and actually quite well-grounded fact that uh, this industrial region would most probably fall into ever, even worse devastation in case of, in case of um, Ukraine's more deeper integration with the EU. Of course, this is not the case against any kind of, any kind of integration, but this is a huge, huge question of what kind of model was suggested by the West, by the EU, to uh, Ukraine and especially to these people, which actually had had some reasons um, to um, to kind of have um, in the end uh, more pro-Russian sentiments. Mm, I think um, that's really important uh, context to bring in as well. In the, in this film, I think the strength of, of stringing together all of that immediate reportage is that you can, you know, from the beginning of the film to the end, you can see these um, sort of sincere, quite emotionally strong feelings that the protesters are expressing being corralled and organized into what by the end of the film looks like a more, you know, looks like war propaganda, you know, as, as, as kind of violence enters and, um, uh, the movement is is co-opted and supported by by the Russian military, but at the same time, what I mean, what's happened in Ukraine over the last couple of years is that really you've had these two rival power blocks trying to impose their own imagery on the situation, and it, it, you know, just watching the 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 British news coverage of the Maidan protests, for example, when they were happening, you could see how. Um, the news organisations here were trying to impose their kind of pre-packaged narrative that this was essentially reliving the fall of the Iron Curtain over again. You know, I remember one particular news report where, you know, the guy had gone to the front line of where the Maidan protesters were in front of, you know, facing off against the police and, 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 and that, you know, the, the whole narration on that news report was essentially, you know, this is the new front line, this is where communism is going to fall over, you know, once and again. And um, essentially what you've had is these two kind of rival narratives trying to be imposed on the situation. So the, the kind of Russian narrative is that, you know, these are fascists, this is like, we're, you know, we're fighting the great patriotic war all over again. Um, and what the kind of Maidan uprising gave an opportunity for was for filmmakers like yourself and people to produce and distribute their own images that sort of circumvented those, those two power blocks. I mean, is there still the opportunity to do that in Ukraine now? Yeah, okay, um, just going back a little bit uh, to the beginning of the question, of course it's, it's both easy, it's easy and in a, way, in a way correct to see the uh, 
the war in Ukraine or this conflict in Ukraine as a kind of uh, a result of the rivalry of the two geopolitical blocks, which are equally, un, um, equally wrong in a way, but uh, I think that what is lost really in this picture and uh, what is this Biden spot is actually uh, the people in Ukraine, uh, because one of, this, uh, one of these options did actually have a very much uh, mass movement in its favor, while the, uh, in extremely oppressive circumstances, under constant um, police violence and so on, and it could make a case for um, itself and ultimately kind of win. Whereas the second option, I should repeat myself, it didn't really have the, any kind of comparable uh, mass support um, over in the population, which is not to say that, that, that people, uh, that, that those, uh, that part of the population uh, who went for this uh, second option is to be ignored. But the truth is that if you uh, kind of still uh, go into reclaim any idea of democracy, then this should be taken into account. And this is not just mere geopolitics. There are other subjects also at, at, at play um, there. Mm. Um, as for your question, I think that it's, uh, of course, it's, uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, it's possible. And um, uh, the cynical, the cynical thing about this is that uh, artists, and especially uh, kind of socially engaged artists, so-called, could be seen as uh, one of the very few beneficiaries of what is going on. Unfortunately, this is something that has to be acknowledged. Uh, first, uh, there is a huge switch in the attention economy globally. Like Ukraine did not exist in the I don't know in the media or in the in the art scene. Basically, I don't. This is not to say it is wrong that now this attention economy is there. I think it's really wrong that it was not there before. It's not that like the uh, the film scene or the art scene became kind of very interesting overnight because of this happened. It's not the case. And the problem was that basically the lack of attention and uh, this kind of, uh, again, the blind spot that Ukraine was um, globally is one of the reasons of, the, uh, of this conflict. Um, if we've got time, it would be great to have some comments and questions from people in the audience. So would anybody like to ask something? And I think there's a microphone doing the rounds. Yes. Um, just, just a few comments, really, because I suppose that uh, coming from Poland, a country that was always in the kind of creme de la creme of the post-communist, uh, you know, Soviet bloc, um, you know, experienced this sort of being the white stain in a much less, you know, much you know, in a completely different way, but in a, in, I would like to say that actually this uh, interpretation of like the former East undergoing this, uh, you know, fall of communists over and over again is not completely stupid, because as you and I know, Alexei, you know, that uh, in those countries of the uh, ex-Soviet bloc, this uh, difference, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 the taint or, you know, the, the, the trace of, of Having, ha having had been the part of the Soviet bloc has never really disappeared. And to various degrees, of course, l much less in Poland, and, you know, because of all of those opportunities and economic inclusion from the very start and, and to a much greater degree in Ukraine. And I'm very glad that you pointed out the kind of economical factor, because I think that the ideological factor has been overplayed from the beginning very much, and the economical was uh, underplayed, and I think it's very important. And I think... Um, yeah, that, uh, that this sort of, that those differences, you know, uh, in a country like Poland, I mean, uh, this sort of, uh, there, ha there has always been to a much lesser degree again than in Eastern or Western Ukraine, but there was, there were always uh, this uh, difference, this, um, this kind of, um, you know, pro-communist pro and anti-communist people, they kind of melted into people who were more successful economically after 89 and people who are less so. And people who kind of this kind of um, narrative of this disenfranchised has been completely uh, bought by the church, for instance, in Poland. 
you know, much less by the sort of transformation of those, those sentiments into some kind of left. And this is also something that is uh, dominant in many post-communist countries. Okay, just not to be the person who dominates the microphone for half an hour. Um, I want to ask you about the kind of, because we talked about those things many times, and um, we, I remember we talked about, we raised the notion of false consciousness, because I felt that uh, you could even see in your film, one could see it in your film, that at the beginning there, there was much more support to the cause of the rebellions that the, at the end that at the beginning you would, you would have those kind of mass um, congregations on the squares of the cities, you know, people, and, you know, uh, whichever with the right con consciousness or false consciousness because manipulated by the, by the Russian propaganda or elsewhere, uh, and at the end it's kind of fading down to the degree that the woman who is voicing her completely legitimate grievances and she feels abandoned by both sides in a way, she's kind of taken out from the, um, you know, taken out from the Agora, you know, she's cleared off. And I wanted to ask you about this false consciousness, because obviously a lot of grievances those, that those people in the East were voicing are real. They are not made up. And uh, the fact that they are uh, looking, you know, uh, for a savior in Putin is obviously tragic, but, you know, it's a part probably of this false consciousness and also about this uh, disenfranchised post-Soviet people who were just completely neglected by everyone. So, you know, do you think is that there is a chance of basically reverting this false consciousness and kind of uh, what would have to happen so that this false consciousness was reversed, uh, you know, and those people were stopped, were, were, you know, weren't seeing started seeing properly, because it's all about perception as well, and I think that film is a very nice tool of showing that that as a tool of propaganda, counter-propaganda. So, yeah, is there any chance of reversing that false consciousness, basically? Yeah, I will first refer to the first part of the, uh, your statement. So, of course, um, um, I can, uh, one should agree that uh, uh, the, the politics of Europe, the politics of the EU uh, towards the east, towards its east or towards Ukraine is colonial uh, economically. This is quite clear, uh, but then it's also an easy, an easy rhetorical way out of the fact that whereas um, the West is dominating these territories economically, uh, the, Russian the Russian imperialist response is domination by tanks and uh, should we kind of, um, um, of course, um, fall into a trap of uh, not seeing a lesser evil or seeing a lesser evil? I think it's quite obvious that economical domination and military domination are incomparable, uh, although, they, although one is the reaction to the other. And um, about the uh, false consciousness, yeah, uh, of course, you uh, rightly observed the uh, decline uh, not only in not only in uh, uh, the participation uh, in this movement, which uh, uh, is in a way represented here, uh, but also a decline in any kind of uh, possibility to speak, because um, what actually which actually happened in this uh, region was the takeover of of the power by actually juntas, the military juntas. We know the term Kiev junta, but if you look at the exact meaning of the term, the people with guns who came and took power, this was in the east. And of course, um, the other, uh, yeah, to, be, to get even more pessimistic, the, like the events uh, in this film are followed up to actually the the beginning of the real hostilities, the real war, and uh, the war uh, is a situation when uh, the what you call the false consciousness is becoming very, very deeply entrenched. And I think that it's um, I I don't have a, a, after all uh, the violence and the bloodshed of what happened. I don't really have a, a, what to say about uh, kind of uh, reclaiming uh, this these people's. Uh, authentic uh, grievances and so on, because now I can totally understand that they have very much authentic uh, grievances also against the Ukrainian army, for example, and the Ukrainian state which uh, sent this army in response to a provocation by uh, this kind of military men. 
of course, um, the, uh, the elephant in the room here is, uh, is Russian Federation, not just as a military actor, but as an economic system, which, which kind of at first lured these people into a kind of a specter of prosperity, but then obviously it's clear that uh, the economical um, system that is, uh, exists in, in Russia now, it's, um, it's, not, it's, it's not viable, it's going to, it's going to have, um, it is in deep crisis and it's going to be, to be worsened and uh, it's, um, it may sound really grim, but uh, the end of the false consciousness, there would be the end of uh, the Putinist, uh, uh, the Putinist, uh, the Putinist model in Russia, which I think uh, will come. I'm, I'm sure there are more questions over here. Yes. Um, just a little comment. I found it really interesting how the two practices were curated together in a way. I think that they offered really useful insights into each other, in fact. Um, me, personally, my identity very much belongs with feminism, art, and digital. I'm from Ukraine. Um, and I felt like what was shown, the Ukrainian war, you used the word hybrid. I think, for me, it's hybrid because for every real bullet that's fired, there are like a thousand internet bullets. Very much like the anger that was shown was spurred by the constant violence and aggression online. Um, and while all of us like to express our grievances and somehow fight our agenda using digital tools, um, I think this case is a very sad lesson in which, which can show us how um, like funny little pictures can actually turn into very real violence and not just violence in how Facebook allows you, doesn't allow you to use your real name. I think it's just, it's a really good contrast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I also find it quite peculiar that we are having an all-male panel here. Now, to this, uh, sorry about well, but, but thanks very much for that comment. I was um, also trying to make some connections between those two panels because I think that even though you said that in your view there was no connection, I think there were a lot of connections actually. And I would like to tease them out and also um, at the end encourage you to try to emphasize, because I think in your film there's lots of connections to the influence of digital technology in that situation. You know, for example, there's an internet poll being mentioned, which is a very obvious example. There is, um, <laughs> in the previous panel, I think, Linda, you mentioned, you know, the utopia of the 90s where people could be anonymous online and use avatars. And in your film, there was this scene on the stairs of the, I don't know, municipal building where basically the real world avatars, the anonymous ones, you know, the bots, were basically uh, in creating politics very, very much live and real. I also, just to continue the quoting of the lines from the beginning of the film, which were really memorable, the line I found most memorable, and I thought it was genius, was this guy who said, basically, I personally do not, what did he say? Uh, uh, recognize. recognize this government. I thought, my God, this is genius. This encapsulates the whole situation because the whole point of having a government is that an individual does not have to recognize the government because there is a concept of sovereign power whereby you invest basically the power in the government or the sovereign. It doesn't matter whether you recognize it or not. And this actually has a lot to do with the idea of incorporation, right, that we were discussing previously because the incorporation is the creation of the body politic of the government of the sovereign and what we saw here is really the incorporation in the other sense of the word meaning the falling apart of the body politic the coming apart of the Leviathan, right? This is the other meaning of incorporation. What happens actually when I personally or anyone personally does not recognize the government anymore? It's just like the other side of the coin, right? Of the incorporation as a corporation, you know, as an enterprise 
or uh, we can also look at the, its aesthetic form, no? the corporate aesthetics. So this is the decorporate aesthetics, the incorporate aesthetics. The incorporate aesthetics is the aesthetics of the real world avatar, right? That remains anonymous behind his balaclava. So I think actually there's really a lot of connections between both of the presentations. And um, yeah, maybe you could expand a little on the relation of digital technology in the, on, on, on the impact of digital technology on that situation. Yeah, um, of course, uh, the connection is, um, uh, is tremendous. Uh, I would say that the, in, case of, in case of this work, um, what has to be stressed is that it actually it comes from the internet. It was originally, as I said, uh, its destination was uh, was YouTube first. So it was it was part of this, it was part of this information or counter information campaigns that were uh, that were taking place at that time, uh, trying to explain what's going on, maybe in a really kind of p p positivistic way, even although uh, although uh, the, the influence of the, of digital culture and of digital anxieties or whatever on the conflict is incredible and this is uh, of course something that uh, should have been spoken spoken uh, about today but this is just a, such a vast such a vast uh, field that it's at this moment just um, needs to be approached somehow because of course what what you could hear also um, some of these people saying were were very obviously kind of the results of, of uh, were, the, were the outcomes of what they read on the internet, kind of information obviously disseminated by the trolls and the Russian bots, like about the concentration camps that are being built by the Turks uh, for, the, for, for them uh, in uh, Ukraine-controlled uh, territories, which is like, you know, uh, and... Uh, and, and things like that. So, so basically, there was a notion that, um, uh, which I find a little bit doubtful, that this war in Ukraine is actually uh, the war that is unique because it's provoked, it's it's provoked and ignited uh, mostly or solely by the by the online media, which of course is not entirely true because there were some authentic, of course, economic uh, grievances that led to these frustrations and so on. Uh, but um, you know, expanding on the tools of Russian propaganda now would take would take really a lot of time. I would just have to say that, of course, uh, we wanted to represent this dimension in this film as well. And basically, every interview uh, that we did with these people had at least the traces of this kind of information rubbish that was kind of thrown on them. Uh, about and basically, and basically, their initial intention to come out and block uh, the Ukrainian army, as if as if the Ukrainian army would now leave the barracks and kill them all, was imposed on them by by um, by uh, basically Russian television and the internet. And yeah, uh, one more thing is that the internet, of course, is uh, very important, but. Uh, I come from the part of the world where people still watch television as well, and it's pretty influential, and people still watch Russian television a lot, especially in these areas at that time. So, uh, but this is entirely, this is a more old school technology which didn't really totally wane, unfortunately. Yeah, and what you said about the, uh, uh, the, the sovereign and the, and the recognition of the government. Mm, the trick is that, of course, there is this notion of the sovereign, but then there is a notion of representative democracy that uh, these people are somehow strangely advocating because uh, what actually happened in Kiev was the overthrow of the government because it lost legitimacy, uh, I think, and it, was, uh, it, could not, it couldn't govern anymore. Uh, and the country was actually run by non-elected government for some time, which was a civilian, it was not military junta, it was uh, uh, weak, it, it couldn't do anything with these people. Uh, but basically what these people were at, in the beginning at least claiming was that they don't recognize them exactly because they uh, are not uh, elected. Um. 
Thanks. Um, I was thinking about your comment, which I think was really great that you made it about the kind of attention economy. You know, it's, it's a glib comment, but it's also very important that kind of the only people benefiting are artists in kind of the space. And I'm from South Africa and that happened there, of course, like decades ago. So it's not necessarily a kind of new thing. But I just wonder about, so kind of, it's quite a complicated question, but how you position this work in the space that you made it. So of course it kind of circulates in an international art world arena and it has these kind of meanings then that relate to this attention economy that relate to kind of a particular interest in this moment. But does it circulate kind of in Ukraine? Is it circulating there? What is your relationship to kind of this object in that space, I guess? Um, yeah, so of course it's an exaggeration to say that uh, the artists are the only people who benefited. Of course there are many other people who benefited as part of attention economy and as part of the so-called you know, real economy. So, um, but, but art is part of that, uh, of course. And as for the circulation of uh, the film in Ukraine, uh, yes, luckily this, uh, this film is, uh, is now uh, on display at the exhibition that my collective uh, did in Kiev. So, uh, um, which is also one of the reasons why um, it is being shown, although it's actually a little bit a work in progress, it's before post-production, the sound is not uh, yet done and so on. But it was the, the, there was this uh, uh, kind of feeling of urgency that we had that at this point in time, like, we shouldn't really wait anymore and it should be uh, circulated, especially, of course, in... Uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine, um, yeah, which of course one thing is to show it in Kiev and the other thing is to show it in the uh, East. Uh, hopefully there will be uh, screenings also in, the, in, um, in that part of the country soon. But yeah, of course this, um, it's happening. Yeah, um, uh, when you talk about uh, profiting also from the war, there was another group of people uh, profiting from the war and this conflict. There was also another group that just short comment, like example, previous government from Georgia, like Saakashvili's government, they were also profiting a lot from this kind of conflict, kind of like how to say, like an extremely new liberalist, um, uh, pseudo uh, reformist European, uh, pro-European government. And um, uh, they were openly also like uh, uh, supporting the war and this, because of support, they try to somehow rehabilitate and kind of like, um, it's now um, uh, their face, which was all completely ruined in the country. And in the end, also they were hired by the by the, this government, also uh, Ukrainian government, recently also as a kind of including Saakashvili as a advisor. So they also were completely profiting from this war, this kind of like a pseudo European. Uh, the, the governments in the region. Yeah, uh, the striking news uh, from last night is that Saakashvili is not just the advisor, he became a governor of Odessa region in Ukraine. Saakashvili, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is true, yeah. Uh, some, uh, yeah, last night. My minister so also. He is, this is, yeah, this is part of, of course, this is a longer story, but there is also this thing of uh, strange kind of changes in the sovereignty of all these countries like um, a lot of not only Georgian but also Lithuanian and Latvian politicians became uh, became part of the government of Ukraine. So it's, there's a kind of a new transnational kind of corporation state being formed in the east of Europe. Like with all these discredited neoliberal politicians, like getting jobs in the neighboring countries in the government. Uh, Corporation, it's corporation state, corporation state. Yeah, it's like um, the state which is undergoing an extremely uh, harsh, like a shock doctrine uh, transformation. Uh, of course, um, it's quite obvious uh, to anyone in Ukraine who has read this book by Naomi Klein that she should have written another chapter uh, about Ukraine for sure. So what is what is the kind of um, impact and the kind of um, uh, 
uh, utilization of uh, war to impose the extremely antisocial measures and so on, including Saakashvili becoming the governor of part of Ukrainian territory. Like, you know, it's quite unthinkable. Uh, yeah. Of course, this is uh, the, 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 other, the other side of the, of the military aggression when its victim kind of uh, feels entitled to kind of uh, to, go, to use extreme kind of measures that would not be, that would not be possible if this state of, of, of the victimhood was not there to victimize its uh, citizens. So, is there another comment or question? Okay. Well, well thanks a lot. Thank you. Alexi.